Good morning from BBC London News. I'm Catherine Carpenter. New figures have revealed that more men than women have been the victims of acid attacks in London since 2012. Drain cleaner, sulfuric acid and bleach were among the substances used in the 26 attacks in the capital. 2013 saw the most victims with 10 cases recorded. There were six incidents last year. A rail company is being accused of failing to make promised improvements to the Thameslink and Great Northern lines since it won the franchise to run them more than a year ago. Hertfordshire County Council says there's still an unacceptably high level of cancellations and delays. Govia Thameslink Railway says it's making improvements and working to recruit new drivers. And a Grade 1 listed cemetery in the capital is to receive more than £6 million of funding to secure its future. Brompton Cemetery is one of the oldest in London. These pictures are from 1915. The suffragette Emmeline Pankhurst is among more than 200,000 people buried there. Now let's take a look at the travel situation now. And we've got a good service on most tube lines this morning. With the district line is part suspended, as, as to uh, London Overground, there are problems there between Richmond and Stratford and between Clapham Junction and Willesden Junction due to a signal failure with Greater Anglia trains accepting tickets. Elsewhere on public transport, southeastern trains are still running a replacement bus service between Lewisham and Dartford. That's via Bexley Heath following the landslips this week. On the road, this is the North Circular, where there are delays building towards the roadworks in Neasden. These are the southbound queues to Staples Corner and the M1. And in Bromley, there are lane restrictions on the A21 Tweedy Road at East Street. That's because of a traffic light failure at Bromley North Station. Now let's get a check on the weather with Elizabeth Rizzini. Hello, good morning. It's going to feel very cold indeed today and tomorrow and it will be even chillier over the course of the weekend. Now today we have to factor in quite a lot of wind chill as well, a rather blustery feel to things and there'll be some showers pushing through a bit later on through the afternoon. But for most of us it's a dry, bright start. It'll start to cloud over through the course of the morning. The wind is really going to pick up, taking the edge off the temperatures and eventually we'll start to see those showers tracking down from the north. Now those showers could turn a little bit wintry, some sleet, even possibly a few flakes of snow, particularly over the tops of the Chilton but even to lower levels just for a short time for this evening before that system pulls away again. So as we head through the course of the night then it should stay mostly dry, a few flakes of snow again possible over parts of Sussex this time but for us dry temperatures dropping below freezing for many of our rural spots so a very cold night to come. Tomorrow again it's going to feel pretty chilly, the wind should be a bit lighter, lots of sparkling sunshine around tomorrow and it will be dry, six or seven degrees Celsius will be the high and it's looking even colder over the course of the weekend, some really cold air pushing through temperatures in many of our rural spots could get down as low as minus three minus four degrees celsius but it will stay dry over the weekend and there'll be lots of sunshine around too i'll be back with another update from the bbc london newsroom in half an hour's time until then there's plenty more on our website at the usual address and on bbc radio london bye bye for now let your new year start with a bang and visit an explosive new China. Look what China has achieved. Celebrate a country 4,000 years in the making. China begins here. Getting out into the streets and seeing what it's all about. And see this little known nation in a brand new light. So distinctive and so brilliant. Starts with Story of China next Thursday at 9 on BBC Two. Hello, this is Breakfast with Naga Manchetti and Charlie State. Gunfire and a series of bomb blasts hit the Indonesian capital, Jakarta. At least seven people are dead, including four attackers, as the explosions target the city centre. Good morning, it's Thursday the 14th of January. Also coming up this morning, the Met Police sets out plans for hundreds of extra officers to carry guns in response to the Paris attacks. The big energy firms are put under pressure to cut prices after huge falls in their wholesale costs. Good morning, in the next few minutes, Tesco will tell us how Christmas went for them. I'm looking back at a week of festive figures to see how the store wars affected sales. Morning in sport for the second day running, the Premier League boasts a three-all thriller. Joe Allen's last-minute equaliser, ensuring Liverpool and Arsenal shared the spoils at Anfield. 
As the report says the UK fails to treat transgender people as equals, we'll hear about the challenges faced by one family and their six-year-old. She could decide tomorrow to go back to being a boy. She's our child at the end of the day. She's, she's yeah, I just want her to be happy. And Matt has the weather for us. Good morning. If you've not got rain, sleet, snow, it's ice the issue this morning for the uh, commute. And later on, we could see some severe gales across parts of eastern England. I'll take you through the full forecast in just over 15 minutes. See you then. Thanks, Matt. Good morning. First, our main story. There's been a series of large explosions in the centre of the Indonesian capital, Jakarta, followed by reports of gunfire. At least seven people have been killed, including four attackers and a police officer. There's no indication yet of who might be behind the assault, but the Indonesian president has termed the attacks as an act of terror. Blasts at several locations, including a shopping centre near the presidential palace and UN offices in the Sana area. We can speak now to Kiki Sariga, who's in Jakarta for us this morning. Uh, Kiki, I know this is uh, only unfolding in the last hour. I wonder if you could just uh, talk us through the sequence of events. Just trying to check, uh, Kiki, can you hear us? Kiki Sariga in uh, Jakarta. Uh, we're yes, just trying to, uh, if you could talk us through now the sequence of events. The, we understand the first blast was just over an hour ago. Hi, can you hear me? Is that good? Test, test? Yes, Kiki, we can hear you. Uh, can you hear us in the studio here in London? We're just trying to check, uh, Kiki, about the sequence of events uh, that unfolded uh, just over an hour ago. Hi, um, would you like me to describe the scene now and uh, what's going on? Uh, what we'll do, we're going to go back to Kiki in just a moment. You can tell we've got one, two problems with the communications there. We're just reporting this morning on, on this uh, series of explosions in Jakarta. We'll get the very latest for you in a few minutes' time. Kanu Priya Kapoor can join us now. He's at the scene in Jakarta as well. Kanu Priya, um, can you tell us what you've been hearing in the last few hours as this has been taking place? Hi there. Um, uh, yeah, this is Kanu Priya Kapoor for Reuters in Jakarta. I'm at the the intersection in the, um, uh, um, uh, the central business district in Jakarta where uh, an explosion, where at least two explosions have taken place uh, a couple of hours ago now. Um, one hit a, uh, a small police post at the intersection and the other seems to have hit a Starbucks cafe and the impact from the explosion has completely, just completely destroyed the cafe. There's debris everywhere, there's shattered glass everywhere. Um, there seems to be uh, a body uh, lying in, in the middle of the street uh, who police say um, is either the victim or the suicide bomber that, that carried out the attack. Either a victim of the attack or the suicide bomber who carried out the attack. There are still um, reports about uh, gunmen who are still inside the building where the Starbucks cafe is, but these are unconfirmed. Uh, police are police have surrounded the building. It's uh, there's a very very heavy security presence here at the moment. And if you want, I can go into detail about that. Uh, yes, please do, um, Kanu Priya. Yeah, well, um, the security presence is you know there's just hundreds of armed police. There's military bomb squads. There's uh, snipers here around the building and at this intersection armored trucks. Um, I just recently spoke to the chief of the intelligence, the National Intelligence Agency, who told me that um, this is definitely terrorism, but that there are no indications yet that this is related at all to Islamic State. Okay. Um, Kanu Priya Kapoor, many thanks. A Reuters journalist talking to us from the scene in Jakarta. At the moment, we understand officially that um, seven people in total have died in those accounts, and it's assumed or it's thought that four of those were attackers. So look at the rest of the day's news now. Hundreds of extra armed officers are to be trained by London's Metropolitan Police to counter the threat of a terrorist attack. 600 more are expected to receive firearms training on top of the 2,000 in the city who can already carry guns. While well, across England and Wales, the overall number of armed officers has dropped in recent years. Our Home Affairs correspondent Danny Shaw has more. The attacks in Paris last year involving marauding gunmen prompted Scotland Yard to reassess its ability to prevent terrorism, respond to incidents and provide reassurance to the public. 
Last month, Sir Bernard Hogan Howe said the number of armed patrols by the Metropolitan Police had risen by a third and he wanted to increase that further. Today he'll set out more details of how that'll be done. It's likely to mean that 600 officers will be selected and trained to use firearms in addition to around 2,000 who are currently authorised to carry weapons in London. Across England and Wales, the number of armed officers fell by a thousand between 2010 and 2014. The Home Office has now made £34 million available to improve police firearms capacity and help forces deal more quickly and effectively with a gun attack. Danny Shaw, BBC News. In a few minutes, we'll talk to the chair of the Metropolitan Police Federation and we'll ask him whether more armed officers is the best way to prevent terrorist attacks. Falling wholesale energy prices are not being reflected in millions of household bills, according to a study by the market information company ICIS. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said domestic energy prices were not falling fast enough, putting the big energy suppliers under a new pressure to cut prices. A senior member of the government has said that remaining in an unchanged European Union would be disastrous for Britain. Yes, in a newspaper article, Chris Grayling, the leader of the House of Commons, described the referendum on the UK's membership as a crucial crossroads. Our political correspondent, Ross Hawkins, in Westminster for us this morning. Uh, so, Ross, it's always very sensitive at the moment whenever anyone says anything about the referendum, and this is particularly so, isn't it? Yeah, fantastically sensitive stuff. And the normal rules of engagement are if you're in the Cabinet, you pretend to agree with the Prime Minister, even if you think he's got everything wrong. Now, that rule will be suspended once David Cameron's done a deal on Europe and we get to a referendum campaign. His Cabinet colleagues will be able to disagree with each other, but not yet. So how does Chris Grayling manage to do this? He does it by choosing his words very carefully, backs the Prime Minister, but says how Eurosceptic he is. And what will matter is how many of his other cabinet colleagues feel the need to come out before that deal is done and start to have this debate a little bit earlier than David Cameron probably expected. Ross, thank you. The French president, Francois Hollande, has sent his sincere condolences to the families of three people killed in an avalanche in the French Alps. Two French schoolchildren and a Ukrainian tourist were killed while skiing near the Le Des Alpes resort, which had been closed to the public for a month due to the risk of avalanches. Two other pupils and a teacher were seriously injured. A British aid worker goes on trial in France today for smuggling a child from a refugee camp in Calais to the UK. Rob Laurie, who's from Leeds, is charged with aiding illegal immigration. He hid a four-year-old girl in his vehicle after her family repeatedly begged him to take her to England. Let's get more from our France correspondent, Hugh Schofield, who's at the court in northern France for us. Morning, Hugh. Um, what more can you tell us about this? Morning. It's rather remarkable and heartbreaking case. Yeah, Lo Rob Laurie is, is the former soldier from Leeds who <coughs> was so moved by the picture of Elan Kurdi, if you remember last year, the, the little Syrian boy who drowned, that he, he sold up everything and left his job and came out to uh, the jungle, so-called, in Calais to help build shelters and so on, raised money and came out. And while there he befriended a, an Afghan man and his daughter, Baha. Um, this Afghan man persuaded him or tried to persuade him over and again to, to bring his daughter to England, where uh, he has family legally settled. Um, uh, Rob Larry resisted, but eventually um, relented simply under the pressure and the emotional, the compassion that he felt for this little girl in these appalling circumstances. The problem was that uh, uh, as he tried to get the girl across the channel, um, two Eritreans had smuggled themselves into his van. They were caught by sniffer dogs and uh, she was caught as well. Uh, he was taken into custody. This is back in October and his court case starts here today at the Boulogne uh, courthouse uh, this afternoon. He's charged with uh, helping illegal immigration effectively. Um, there is a maximum fine of uh, five years in prison. I think that's highly unlikely, uh, but we'll have to see what happens this afternoon. He says there was no money involved. It was pure compassion that made him do what he did. OK. All right, Hugh, many thanks. Hugh Schofield there in Paris. Yes, in the last few minutes, Tesco revealing their figures over the Christmas period, and Steph has the details. Yes, good morning good to morning. you both. Bit of a surprise from Tesco this morning, because we were expecting them to say what most of the... Uh, 
big supermarkets have been saying, which is that sales are down. But actually, sales were up for them over Christmas, and not just by a tiny bit, by 1.3%, which doesn't sound like much, but in supermarket terms, that's quite a lot, given the, the environment over the last few weeks. So what's it done differently, then? So uh, they're saying that they've just... Uh, it's been about price for them, that they've offered their customers the best. I mean, they're bound to say that. But what's interesting is their Christmas, in particular, has been strong. If you look at the quarter overall, so the three months including Christmas, sales were actually down. And they said that's because they weren't running the same um, offers as they were the previous year and that's why it's brought the figures down but if you just look at the, the six weeks of Christmas up to the 9th of January they have done a lot better than everyone thought they would and some people I've seen on Twitter are already saying is this the fight back against Aldi and Lidl because that's who they've been really fighting against even though they're the biggest supermarket chain Tesco they've got something like 28% of the market share of the grocery sector and Aldi and Lidl together have only got 11% so they're very small in comparison but they have been taking customers away from the likes of Tesco so things are looking like they're turning around for the company in terms of getting uh, customers back in spending with them again okay Steph we'll leave it there for now thank thanks you thanks very much time now is 11 minutes past seven more armed police will soon patrol London streets to tackle the threat of a Paris style terror attack gunmen and suicide bombers killed 130 people in the French capital late last year since the attacks police forces here have been reviewing how they operate and what resources they need well Ken Marsh is the chair of the Metropolitan Police Federation and is in our London newsroom for us and we can talk to him now good morning Ken Marsh thank you for joining us morning morning um, your reaction then to what these 600 police officers who are going to be trained and made available um, to use firearms? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that's the number that uh, is going to be added. We haven't actually been told that yet. But uh, clearly our commissioner has had a good opportunity to look at the numbers required strategically since what took place uh, previous to Christmas in France and uh, other areas in Europe and has recognised that uh, we do need more firearms officers available on the streets of London. Is this to prevent a terrorist attack or, as we've been warned many times, as the terror threat in the UK is, is significantly higher, is this in reaction to what's expected to happen? Uh, I, I think it's because we've had a good look at what we have and the capability we have on our streets of London um, and it's been recognised that to deal with major incidents in the centre of London, uh, we need to put more officers available uh, with firearms. We have a large number of officers, but uh, it's the number of firearms officers that we need to increase. Willing are police officers to, uh, to actually ta undertake this training and do this, considering there have been concerns about the, how they are treated if they do shoot? Yeah, we, we need to recognise that all our firearms officers in the Metropolitan Police are volunteers. They all apply to do it. They're not forced to do it at all. Um, and we just need to understand uh, what we're doing for them in terms of their protection when they go out and put themselves uh, in front of everyone else to protect the public of London. So how can that be um, assured? Well, we've heard the Prime Minister recently make comments around firearms officers being protected by law. Um, we need to recognise that and look at the changing of legislation if required so that when they go out and pull the trigger, and it's an honest held belief, that they're going to be fully supported by their colleagues and the government. Have you heard anything to the contrary that um, they don't feel secure in getting this support or backing if they are put in a situation where they have to shoot? Uh, I, I haven't heard anything saying that, that they don't feel that they sh could do their jobs correctly. They, they're obviously looking very carefully at recent incidents that have taken place. They're looking very carefully at uh, the support they get and they need to be recognised for that because when a scenario takes place, God forbid something like took place in France, uh, we need to know that our officers can go out and do their jobs efficiently without worrying what the outcome will be afterwards. Ken Marsh, Chairman of the Metropolitan Police Federation, many thanks for talking to us on Breakfast. Let's see, the time now is 7.15 exactly. You're watching Breakfast from BBC News. A reminder of our main stories this morning. A series of large explosions have left at least seven people dead in the Indonesian capital, Jakarta, including four attackers. The country's president has described them as acts of terror. 
Hundreds more armed police officers could soon be on London streets in response to the threat of terrorism. Quite a few of you get in touch this morning saying there's pictures of snow in some parts of the UK. Matt, what's the picture? Hello there. It's a pretty messy picture this morning. Good morning, too. We've got a mixture of rain and sleet for some. If you've not got that, you've got ice. And as Charlie mentioned, the coating of snow for one or two uh, through this morning. We've got a Met Office amber warning in force across the southeast of Scotland, around the borders in particular. This is where I see the heaviest snow in the next few hours. That snow, though, is pushing its way southwards. And uh, we'll start to see it snow a little bit more across parts of northeast England, mainly rain towards the coast. It's going to be mainly across the northeast of England, further west, just one or two wintry showers here and there. There will be some drier moments around. Head further south, uh, rain is uh, with you, but there's some sleet and snow mixed in across the Midlands at the moment. It's been given a covering of snow during the past few hours. Far south of England, most dry, but this is where we've got the risk of ice. Uh, a few showers towards the southwest of England. Uh, same too across Wales. Again, that mixture of rain uh, across some lower level sites, sleet and snow over the hills. We've seen a coating in places across the north and northeast of Wales so far this morning. Do be wary, though, there could be some ice around in the next few hours. More icy conditions, though, more widely across Northern Ireland and Scotland, away from the southeast, that is. And that's because here we've got the clearest of the skies, lowest to the temperatures, but here some sunshine to start the day. That punctuated by some sleet and snow flurries in the far north. Now, the story for the day is many western areas turn drier and sunnier before more sleet and snow arrives in northwest Scotland and Northern Ireland. Central eastern England hold on to the more persistent rain, sleet and snow into the afternoon and Gales, if not severe gale force winds, will develop here. And quite windy across the country this afternoon, making it feel especially raw. Around four to eight on the thermometers, feeling more sub-zero for many of you. So a, a raw end to the day, especially across the eastern parts. But the rain clears away, the gales start to ease. Ice a problem just about anywhere through the night. And we could see another temporary coating of snow across some western areas once again, as we see some further wintry showers push in. And away from that... Temperatures dropping widely below freezing. A widespread frost into Friday morning. Uh, a cold start. Still enough of a bite to that wind to go with it. Could be a temporary covering of snow across some western areas to start with. And a few sleet and snow flurries around throughout the day across northern and western parts, potentially the far east of East Anglia. But tomorrow, most of you will have a dry day with some sunshine at times. And again, feeling quite cold. Three to seven Celsius in thermometers probably feeling a little bit colder than that. But as the wind eases down through Friday into uh, Saturday and the weekend and high pressure builds in, one or two uh, fog patches around, but the big story for many of you will be just how cold it is by night. Severe frost right across the board. If not the uh, coldest conditions for around three years, we could be going back to around 2010, 2011 for some of the temperatures we'll see. But whilst we have that frost in the morning and some lingering fog patches, for many of you, the weekend will be dry and for a time, Fairly sunny. Back to you both. Thanks very much, Matt. See you soon. Time now. It's 18 minutes past seven. A former British soldier could be facing up to five years in a French prison after he smuggled a child out of a refugee camp. Rob Laurie says it was a moral dilemma that forced him to break the law. He was volunteering at the refugee camp, known as the Jungle, when a family pleaded with him to take their four-year-old daughter to relatives in England. He'll go on trial today in Boulogne-sur-Mer in northern France. Let's speak now to Jim Innes, who's also there this morning, campaigning for uh, him. Uh, thank you very much for your time this morning, uh, Jim. I just wonder, first of all, if you could... I know you, you know um, Rob well. I wonder if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about what his account is of what happened that day. Well, it's exactly as you said, you know, um, Rob had been down four or five times uh, to Calais and he'd become friends with people that live there. Um, he'd made a, a team of builders of, of refugees. And what, what happened that day was that some, some paternal instinct just, just kicked in late at night, just before he was going to get on the boat to go home and he was sat there holding uh, brew, as he, he calls Baha, um, in his arms by a fire and looking round. And, you know, she's living next to a chemical factory in an old chemical dump where there's asbestos there. And, you know, if you've seen pictures of Bruce, she's just a, such a lovely, happy, smiling kid. And you look round and, and you, you just see what she's living in and something just snapped and um, the rest, uh, you know. Yes, uh, so his account is that there, there was something inside him that meant he couldn't leave that, that child there at that particular time. But Rob's just a, a fantastic human being, you know, there's, there's nothing about him that's political or anything else. What, what happened was, he was a good Samaritan, you know, what, whatever anybody's religion or politics, he was just out helping people. And uh, he saw someone in trouble, he saw someone in distress, and he helped them. 
you're there supporting him. I know you know him well. You're not suggesting that he shouldn't be in court at all, are you? No, of course not. You know, he has broken a law. Um, there are other laws, like the fact that, you know, he's helped someone in distress, but he's been charged with something that he's fully admitted, and that needs to be heard in court, and, um, and he's, he's prepared for that. What are your fears for him uh, as the trial starts? Well, my fears are that he faces a €30,000, £20,000 fine and up to five years in prison abroad for something that he did out of compassion to help a four-year-old girl. You know, there's been, just last week, a Common Select Committee report saying that we should help 3,000 3, children that are alone uh, in the jungle. Now, Brew had her father there, but she's got family that are living in Leeds, just 10 miles from where we live. Um, you know, there's a room in the house they can pay for her, you know, she, she could be here with her family and she's still stuck in the jungle. Uh, Jim, I know you've uh, volunteered in those same camps. You'll be aware of, of the emotions yes. that you go through. Uh, at the same time, the court may well be keen to lay down a marker, which is that individuals can't take those decisions. It's true, but, you know, I, I'd implore anyone to go into the, including yourselves, into the jungle and into Grand South in Dunkirk, where I went yesterday, and it's absolutely heartbreaking to go in there. You know, I went, in, I went into both camps yesterday, twice to the jungle and once to Grand South in Dunkirk, and the, the conditions, particularly in Dunkirk, are absolutely appalling. And, the, you know, yeah, I still gave out some presents to kids, took some things to the school. You know, there's a human spirit in there, regardless of all this. And, the, you know, I got a few smiles from a few kids, and um, I think that if officials, judges, politicians, if they can get themselves into what is just on our doorstep. You know, if these people were on your doorstep at home, you'd open the door, you'd let these kids in, and, you know, then you'd sort out the problem. And I think that, that any judge should be, should be looking at that and looking at Rob and Rob's history. You know, Rob just helps people. If he was listening to the, um, excuse me, if he was listening to the um, weather today in Yorkshire, he'd be thinking about whether he has to go out and, you know, dig the driveway out for one of his neighbours. You know, when he, when, he, when he heard the news that's just been on about what's happening in Jakarta, you know, perhaps he wouldn't feel like he could help someone there, but he'd, he'd want to help somebody. Uh, Jim, thank you very much for your time this morning. That's Jim Innes, uh, who is a volunteer and campaigner, and uh, Rob thank Laurie's you, uh, trial should take place in France, in northern France, later this morning. 23 minutes past seven is the time. Casual prejudice, prejudice against transgender people by every day, everybody, from doctors to teachers and the police. This is the last bastion of institutional discrimination in Britain to date. Well, that is the finding of a landmark report from a committee of MPs. It's found that high levels of transphobia across society were undermining the lives of over half a million people, that more needed to be done to support under-18s in particular. BBC Radio Manchester presenter Stephanie Hurst who's transgender herself, reports for us now on the challenges children and their parents can face. Getting ready has changed a lot recently. I swapped my razor for a makeup brush 18 months ago when I finally became Stephanie. For over 30 years, I lived as Simon. I had a very successful radio career, hosted my own breakfast show, did the national chart show. And looking at these pictures now, externally, I may look male, but internally I knew I was female, even back to pictures of me as a, as a kid. I was battling with my gender identity. Being in the public eye, transitioning was always going to be difficult, but I was surprised with how unprepared the system actually is. Today's report highlights how much work is still needed when it comes to transgender issues. For me, it got to breaking point, and I'm not alone. A third of trans adults and almost half of trans young people attempt suicide. I'm going to meet a very special little girl and her family. Danny is six years old and was born a boy. Just come through. Thank you. Hi, everyone. You OK? Hello. Hi. This is Craig. Hi, Craig. And Amy. Hi, Amy. And Aidan. I remember one time her looking in the mirror after uh, getting her hair cut, and she just, she, she was distraught. She mm -hmm. thought I was going to make it longer and not not make it shorter. We tried to, to think, OK, this is a phase. Let's just mm. 
Oh, you could dress up as a girl in the house constantly. It would be, why have I got this mummy? Why am I not like you? Why am I like daddy? Why am I like my brothers? Why am I not like my sister? When you think about having to be a boy, how does that make you feel? Annoyed. Yeah, you didn't like being a boy, did you? I hate being a boy. We put letters out to all the parents with information on websites and YouTube clips um, that they could let the kids watch and, and things that had helped us. Danny is one of five children who have all fully accepted her as a girl. Before, when she was younger, was she, was she just very unhappy? Yeah, she always just wanted to be a girl. She never really accepted being a boy. And it's nice to have a sister. Yeah. The number of children and adolescents being treated as transgender is increasing, but cases as young as Danny's are rare. I quickly found that, that doctors weren't going to be able to help or um, even psychologists and stuff that, that we were seeing just didn't have the knowledge to explain anything. I typed in to Google, my son wants to be a girl, and all these things popped up and I had no idea no idea that this was even something so it is it's an education that needs to be out there officially it's known as gender dysphoria for as long as i can remember i felt this way but in the report the main center for treating young people say the majority return to their birth gender she could decide tomorrow to go back to being a boy she's our child at the end of the day she's she's yeah i just want her to be happy the support we had locally gave us the courage to go on and and try and make a difference for for somebody else and for to try and normalise this. The report discusses the use of hormone blockers to delay puberty, which can be controversial. It says that delaying treatment does more harm than good, which Danny's mum supports. It's the case of having a son who might not want to be here or a daughter who could have a happy life and I, I, I think again a, a case of keeping the world happy or keeping your child happy. It's time to go to sleep. Hopefully today's report will protect people who might suffer as a result of their gender identity. As a child I used to dread getting out of bed in the morning but being with Danny I see a happy six-year-old girl who can wake up tomorrow <laughs> feeling comfortable in her own skin. Right. <laughs> Stephanie Hurst, BBC News. Yes, yeah, really interesting hearing from that family. Quite a few people getting in touch today, just uh, prompted by that uh, report. Ian writing, uh, what a courageous and fascinating article by your transgender reporter on the little girl in that family. Uh, and another tweet here, well done, BBC Breakfast. Beautiful and simple piece on trans issues for young children. Yeah, Louise um, saying as well on tr Twitter that we need to educate society on trans issues. Education will prevent confusion. We're going to discuss more of those issues that have been raised in that report with the chief executive of a charity which helps young transgender people and a leading psychiatrist in the field. Time now to get the news, travel and weather where you are. Good morning from BBC London News, I'm Catherine Carpenter. More men than women have been the victims of acid attacks in London since 2012, according to figures from the Met. Drain cleaner, sulfuric acid and bleach were among the substances used in the 26 attacks in the capital. 2013 saw the most victims with 10 cases recorded. There were six incidents last year. A rail company is being accused of failing to make promised improvements since winning the franchise to run two lines more than a year ago. Hertfordshire County Council says there's still an unacceptably high risk of cancellations and delays on the Thameslink and Great Northern lines. Govia Thameslink Railway says it's making improvements and working to recruit new drivers. And a Grade 1 listed cemetery in the capital is to receive more than £6 million of funding to secure its future. Brompton Cemetery is one of the oldest in London. These pictures are from 1915. The suffragette Emmeline Pankhurst is among more than 200,000 people buried there. Now let's take a look at the travel situation. And on the tubes, there's no service on the district line between Earls Court and Wimbledon at the moment because of a signal failure at Fulham Broadway. And there are severe delays on London Overground. 
Elsewhere on public transport, southeastern trains are still running a replacement bus service between Lewisham and Dartford via Bexley Heath. That's following the landslips this week, although Barnhurst Station is due to reopen today. Out on the roads, this is the North Circular, where there are delays building towards the roadworks in Neasden. These are the southbound queues to Staples Corner and the M1. And there are anti-clockwise queues on the M25 following an accident just after Junction 28 for the A12 at the Brook Street roundabout. Finally, in Bromley, there are lane restrictions on the A21 Tweedy Road at East Street. That's because of a traffic light failure by Bromley North Station. Now let's get a check on the weather with Elizabeth Rizzini. Hello, good morning. It's going to feel very cold indeed today and tomorrow and it will be even chillier over the course of the weekend. Now today we have to factor in quite a lot of wind chill as well, a rather blustery feel to things and there'll be some showers pushing through a bit later on through the afternoon. But for most of us it's a dry, bright start. It'll start to cloud over through the course of the morning. The wind is really going to pick up, taking the edge off the temperatures and eventually we'll start to see those showers tracking down from the north. Now those showers could turn a little bit wintry, some sleet, even possibly a few flakes of snow, particularly over the tops of the Chilton but even to lower levels just for a short time for this evening before that system pulls away again. So as we head through the course of the night then it should stay mostly dry, a few flakes of snow again possible over parts of Sussex this time but for us dry temperatures dropping below freezing for many of our rural spots so a very cold night to come. Tomorrow again it's going to feel pretty chilly, the wind should be a bit lighter, lots of sparkling sunshine around tomorrow and it will be dry, six or seven degrees Celsius will be the high and it's looking even colder over the course of the weekend, some really cold air pushing through temperatures in many of our rural spots could get down as low as minus three minus four degrees celsius but it will stay dry over the weekend and there'll be lots of sunshine around too and i'll be back with another update in around half an hour's time until then there's plenty more on our website at the usual address bye bye for now let's take a look at the weather morning matt Good morning, Naga. Very good morning to you as well. It's uh, one of those mornings where there's a bit of everything in the forecast. If you've not got any rain, sleet or snow, you like to have ice to contend with through the morning commutes. But uh, snow is the uh, first uh, issue, though, we have to deal with because there's a Met Office amber warning in place across parts of South East Scotland, particularly the borders. Could see over 10 centimetres of snow on the higher ground still over the next hour or so. That is drifting its way southwards. We're going to see a bit more in the way of sleet and snow across northeast England, mainly rain towards the coast. West of the Pennines, a few uh, flurries here and there, but some drier weather too. Head south of that, well, it's a, a fine boundary between rain, sleet and snow. We've seen some uh, covering of snow across parts of the Midlands so far, a few showers drifting away southwards, which could bring a mixture of rain and sleet. But many southern counties start the day dry, sunny, but quite chilly, and there will be a touch of frost around. The winds light across the south of the moment, they will pick up. It's going to feel increasingly raw as the day goes on. A few rain showers with some sleet over the moors in the southwest. Uh, still some uh, outbreaks of rain, sleet, and snow for Wales, particularly towards the north and the west. Northern Ireland, though, dry start as much as Scotland, but here the biggest ice risk this morning. Some slippery conditions on the roads and the pavements. Away from the snow in the southeast corner. And the wintry flurry is still continuing in the far north, which will be there all day long. Now, throughout the day, the wind will be picking up. Strongest down eastern counties of England. Gales, if not severe gales, developing later. That's going to make it feel especially cold. Uh, outbreaks of rain, sleet and snow continue across eastern counties as well into the afternoon. But come further west, most have the dry and sunny weather. Sleet and snow, though, into uh, northern west of Scotland and Northern Ireland. And yes, it's going to feel much colder than the thermometer suggests, around uh, zero to minus three across many parts of the country. Tonight, though, ice becomes more of a widespread problem with clear skies, uh, especially across central and eastern areas. Uh, could be a covering of snow here and there towards the west. Temperatures may just hold above freezing in some of the uh, towns and cities here, but into the countryside, just about all will drop below freezing tonight, maybe as low as minus eight to minus ten in parts of central Scotland. And then into Friday, a drier start by and large, particularly for England and Wales. There'll be a few sleet and snow showers, the odd covering here and there towards the west. Uh, same too across Scotland and Northern Ireland. But so there'll be hit and miss those showers. Many will spend the bulk of the day dry with some good sunny spells. The wind not as strong as today, but still feeling uh, rather raw out there in the breeze that we do have. The breeze eases down Friday night into Saturday. And at long last, a welcome sight for the start of the weekend. An air of high pressure keeps things largely dry. But under clear skies by night, we could see a few fog patches form. But severe overnight frost really will be the story. Temperatures in parts of Scotland could drop below minus 15 degrees. We could see some of the coldest conditions in over three years. But at least by day, Naga and Charlie, most should see some good crisp winter sunshine. Back to you both. Sounds lovely, Matt. Many thanks.
7.48 the time now. Britain's biggest retailer, Tesco, has revealed that sales in the UK over the crucial Christmas period rose compared with last year. Steph's looking back at a week of festive figures to see how the store wars have affected sales. Yeah, morning to you both. It's been a really busy week for the retail sector and there's a real battle going on between them. Morning, everyone. Yeah, the battle of the retailers, what we call the store wars. In a galaxy not so far, far away, at the checkouts near your home, there is a retail war and rebel discounters seem to have secured a victory against the empire. That's the established supermarkets, Tesco, Asda, Morrison, Sainsbury's, Waitrose and the cooperative. It's a battle for the grocery empire and they all want your hard earned cash. And it's worth the effort because research shows we spent over 40% more on our Christmas food compared to a normal grocery shop. Shoppers at Christmas do tend to push the boat out. They do t tend to spend a little bit extra on the Christmas meal and meals in the run-up to Christmas. So there is an important financial opportunity there. But market analysts do tend to look much wider than just what the sales were. What they want to know is, have these businesses put on a good show for customers? Have they provided innovation, quality, convenience? Have they kept the stores full and have they delighted the shopper? Well, over the last few years, the force has been strong with these guys, the discounters, Lidl and Aldi, with more than a million people extra shopping with them this Christmas compared to the last one. They're growing, but they're still nowhere near as big as the biggest supermarket in the supermarket solar system. The giant is Tesco, which has a 28% share of the sector. And this morning it said sales over Christmas grew compared to last year. It did a lot better than people thought it would. As for the rest of the empire, well, it's a mixed bag with Morrisons, like Tesco, striking back with a small rise in sales. And the food bit at M&S, well, that's continued to shine as well. But Sainsbury's and Waitrose sales were far less stellar. In fact, Waitrose posted its worst performance since 2006. We're also expecting a poor performance at Asda. So what will be the ultimate weapon to win the war? Well, I'll give you a clue. It's certainly not the Death Star. Well, supermarkets are going to continue to focus on service, making it as easy as possible for our shoppers to get at the food and drink products that they need. And I think technology is going to be one of the tools that retailers use to drive ahead on convenience. So our big supermarket operators are going to use multi-channel retail to get their goods to shoppers anywhere, anytime and on their terms. Well, this battle is a long one, so we can expect many more sequels of Star Wars. I feel like I need a lightsaber for this. Oh, they're not even looking at me, are they? Sorry. Yeah. Mm. The force is strong with you. I thought yeah, you were playing clearly. golf. I couldn't work you out. Was playing golf. Golf. I, was yeah, getting, I was getting excited if you were playing golf. But... Yeah, because you're very good at golf. <laughs> yeah, Maybe sure that you should are, be too. my challenge for this year. Steph, thank you. Thank you. Uh, speaking of challenges at 7.51, you may remember we've been following four women from Yorkshire who are hoping to row across the Atlantic. Extraordinary voyage, 3,000 nautical miles, and they're expecting to hit some pretty big challenges. Mm, by now, the Yorkshire rows, as they're known, should be at the halfway point. There's been some stormy weather and it's meant they've had to batten down the hatches and wait it out. We're going to talk to them in a moment. First, here's a reminder of their journey so far. They are the four ordinary mums who are doing something extraordinary. Why? Because I thought we needed a bit of adventure in our lives. <laughs> we said laughter would power them across the Atlantic. We were wrong. This is absolutely nothing like the ocean. Because that is absolutely right. It has been far harder than any of the team expected, any of the 25 teams expected. One competitor has had to be rescued, so severe was his seasickness. And that, by the way, was on a calm day. But the Yorkshire Rose ladies are hanging in there against the odds. Well, I've never been a, a great sailor. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Helen has been very, very ill. They lost power for five days. No GPS, no water machine, no laughing matter. And if laughter won't carry them over to Antigua, maybe their motto will. It'll be fine. It will. It will. It'll be fine. Yeah. We hope so. 
I wonder if they're still smiling. Let's talk to Nikki, who can talk to us via satellite phone from the Atlantic Ocean. Hi, Nikki. How's it going? Hi, yes, we're, we're sat here in the dark, actually, because we're on a different time zone now. So you've had to batten down the hatches, we were saying. The adventure's well underway, but um, how long have you been kind of shut in the cabin? Uh, for three days now, it's been quite rough, actually. So we, we're not in stormy weather anymore, that's past. Um, but it was a big storm that came through. We had to we had to head down south. I spent three days um, rowing as south as we could to try and miss the, the, the eye of the storm, um, which took us out of our way. But we did miss the eye, but we had some spectacular weather and spectacular waves. And, and Nikki, I mean, we've been tracking your, your story, all four of you, how you've been going, getting along. Um, who's... Who's um, coping the best? Because when, when we saw in the piece before we ran, we did know that some of you suffer from seasickness. We hear that other teams um, have had to have rescues because of seasickness. How are you all coping? Yeah, well, Helen had severe seasickness at the beginning. We all had seasickness, but Helen's was the most severe. Um, but by about day five, she was, she was getting over that. And, and it was just getting together as a team and, 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 and sort of helping each other through it. And I think that's the big thing, is making sure that you're getting the, the, the water in and the special hydration packs and, and just looking after each other. That's the important bit. And also, I suppose, keeping your spirits up as well. This is a real test of friendship, isn't it? Because you're supposed to be, what, around half at the halfway point now, but the storms have held you back. Yeah, we're, we're probably slightly behind that now just because of the storm. We've had five days um, and we've got such severe power failures. You know, we're having to pump our own water now instead of using the, the water. You know, we have to use a hand water desalinator. It takes about six hours a day. So it, it's tough, but um, do you know what? The laughter does help. I'm, I'm just really rallying around. and We've had lots of letters that um, our family sent in special packs for the tough times. And each time it's a tough time, postman makes a delivery. Oh, and we get a lovely left watch from our family, and, and it makes a huge difference. That sounds really encouraging. Who's, who's best at keeping the spirits up? Who's the joker in the pack and making you all smile when and you need it? It's it, um, it, it the one that keeps, um, keeps us laughing, um, Jeanette. Um, she keeps popping up um, in various stages of dress or undress to, uh, to tell us a joke or to, to make a joke about the ensuite arrangements in, on, the, on this particular cruise. And that she'll have to make a complaint. But. <laughs> Nikki, we wish you well. Do keep your spirits up. Um, it's a great adventure that you're all on. Jeanette, Helen, Nikki, Francis, we wish you all the best. And no doubt we'll speak to you and track more of your journey. Let's see, 7.56 the time now to get the news travel and weather where you are. Good morning from BBC London News. I'm Catherine Carpenter. More men than women have been the victims of acid attacks in London since 2012, according to figures from the Met. Drain cleaner, sulfuric acid and bleach were among the substances used in the 26 attacks in the capital. 2013 saw the most victims with 10 cases recorded. There were six incidents last year. A rail company is being accused of failing to make promised improvements since winning the franchise to run two lines more than a year ago. Hertfordshire County Council says there's still an unacceptably high level of cancellations and delays on the Thameslink and Great Northern lines. Govia Thameslink Railway says it's making improvements and working to recruit new drivers. And a Grade 1 listed cemetery in the capital is to receive more than £6 million of funding to secure its future. Brompton Cemetery is one of the oldest in London. These pictures are from 1915. The suffragette Emmeline Pankhurst is among more than 200,000 people buried there. Now let's take a look at the travel situation this morning. And on the tubes, the district line is part suspended between Earls Court and Wimbledon. It's because of a signal failure at Fulham Broadway and there are also severe delays on London Overground. Elsewhere on public transport, southeastern trains are still running a replacement bus service between Lewisham and Dartford via Bexley Heath. That's following the landslips this week. Out on the roads, and this is the London-bound traffic on the A40, it's slow through Greenford towards the North Circular at the Hangar Lane gyratory, as you can see. There are anti-clockwise queues on the M25, that's following an accident just after Junction 28 for the A12 at the Brook Street roundabout. In Bromley, there are lane restrictions on the Tweedy Road at E Street, that's because of a traffic light failure by Bromley North Station. And there are westbound delays on the M4 from Junction 3 towards Junction 4 following an accident. Now let's get a check on the weather with Elizabeth Rizzini.
Hello, good morning. It's going to feel very cold indeed today and tomorrow, and it will be even chillier over the course of the weekend. Now, today we have to factor in quite a lot of wind chill as well, a rather blustery feel to things, and there'll be some showers pushing through a bit later on through the afternoon. But for most of us, it's a dry, bright start. It'll start to cloud over through the course of the morning. The wind is really going to pick up, taking the edge off the temperatures, and eventually we'll start to see those showers tracking down from the north. Now, those showers could turn a little bit wintry, some sleet, even possibly a few flakes of snow, particularly over the tops of the Chilton but even to lower levels just for a short time for this evening before that system pulls away again. So as we head through the course of the night then it should stay mostly dry, a few flakes of snow again possible over parts of Sussex this time but for us dry temperatures dropping below freezing for many of our rural spots so a very cold night to come. Tomorrow again it's going to feel pretty chilly, the wind should be a bit lighter, lots of sparkling sunshine around tomorrow and it will be dry, six or seven degrees Celsius will be the high and it's looking even colder over the course of the weekend, some really cold air pushing through temperatures in many of our rural spots could get down as low as minus three minus four degrees celsius but it will stay dry over the weekend and there'll be lots of sunshine around too i'm back in half an hour until then you can follow all the news for london as it happens on the bbc local live page of our website now back to charlie and naga Hello, this is Breakfast with Naga Manchetti and Charlie State. Gunfire and a series of bomb blasts hit the Indonesian capital, Jakarta. At least seven people are dead, including four attackers, as the explosions target the city centre. Good morning. It's Thursday, the 14th of January. Also coming up this morning, the Met Police sets out plans for hundreds of extra officers to carry guns in response to the Paris attacks. The big energy firms are put under pressure to cut prices after huge falls in their wholesale costs. Good morning. Britain's biggest retailer, Tesco, has revealed that sales over the crucial Christmas period were up compared with last year. I'll be looking at why they did better than expected. Morning in sport for the second day running. The Premier League boasts a thrill thriller. Joe Allen's last minute equaliser ensuring Liverpool and Arsenal share the spoils at Anfield. As a report says the UK fails to treat transgender people as equals. We'll hear about the challenges faced by one family and their six year old. She could decide tomorrow to go back to being a boy. She's our child at the end of the day. She's, she's yeah, I just want her to be happy. And the terrifying story of survival that's being tipped for Oscar success. The British star of The Revenant, Will Poulter, is going to join us. And Matt has the weather for us. Good morning. We've got some rain, sleet, even a bit of snow around this morning. If you haven't got any of them, you're likely to have ice. Later on, a raw wind will also dig in. Severe gales for eastern England. I'll take you through the full forecast, though, in 15 minutes. See you then. See you then, Matt. Good morning. First, our main story, there's been a series of large explosions in the centre of the Indonesian capital, Jakarta, followed by reports of gunfire. At least seven people have been killed, including four attackers and a police officer. There's no indication yet of who might be behind the assault, but the Indonesian president has termed the attacks as an act of terror. Blasts hit several locations, including a shopping centre near the presidential palace and UN offices in the Sarana area. One hit a, uh, a small police post at the intersection and the other seems to have hit a Starbucks cafe and the impact from the explosion has completely, just completely destroyed the cafe. There's debris everywhere, there's shattered glass everywhere. Um, there seems to be uh, a body uh, lying in, in the middle of the street uh, who police say um, is either the victim or the suicide bomber that, that carried out the attack. Hundreds of extra armed officers are to be trained by London's Metropolitan Police to counter the threat of a terrorist attack. 600 more are expected to receive firearms training on top of the 2,000 in the city who can already carry guns. Across England and Wales, the overall numbers of armed officers has dropped in recent years. Our Home Affairs correspondent Danny Shaw has more details. The attacks in Paris last year involving marauding gunmen prompted Scotland Yard to reassess its ability to prevent terrorism, respond to incidents and provide reassurance to the public. Last month, Sir Bernard Hogan Howe said the number of armed patrols by the Metropolitan Police had risen by a third and he wanted to increase that further. Today he'll set out more details of how that'll be done. It's likely to mean that 600 officers will be selected and trained to use firearms in addition to around 2,000 
who are currently authorised to carry weapons in London. Across England and Wales, the number of armed officers fell by a thousand between 2010 and 2014. We need to recognise that all our firearms officers in the Metropolitan Police are volunteers, they all apply to do it, they're not forced to do it at all. Um, and we just need to understand uh, what we're doing for them in terms of their protection when they go out and put themselves uh, in front of everyone else to protect the public of London. The Home Office has now made £34 million available to improve police firearms capacity and help forces deal more quickly and effectively with a gun attack. Danny Shaw, BBC News. Falling wholesale energy prices are not being reflected in millions of household bills, according to a study by the market information company ICIS. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said domestic energy prices were not falling fast enough, putting the big energy suppliers under renewed pressure to cut prices. And we'll be speaking to the group which represents energy companies in a few minutes' time here on Breakfast. Britain's biggest retailer, Tesco, has revealed that sales in the UK over the crucial Christmas period rose 1.3%. That's compared to last year. The results this morning were better than analysts expected. Still, they weren't enough to turn around a trend of overall falling sales. Across the last three months as a whole, they actually fell 1.5%. Well, a senior member of the government has said remaining in an unchanged European Union would be disastrous for Britain. Yes, in a newspaper article, Chris Grayling, the leader of the House of Commons, described the referendum on the UK's membership as a crucial crossroads. Our political correspondent, Ross Hawkins, in Westminster for us this morning. So, uh, Ross, is this a, a look ahead to what's going to happen from here on in? Prominent Conservative says something and everyone starts wondering what they really mean. Uh, yeah, I think we are in a, a rather bizarre place at the moment. Normally the rules are simple. You can't disagree with the Prime Minister if you're in the Cabinet. Once a deal is done on Europe, David Cameron says it's fine. Actually, ministers will be able to disagree on this particular issue, but we've not got to that point yet. So Chris Grayling has to write this article that declares himself to be a Eurosceptic, something we probably all knew anyway, in pretty careful language. And then a former minister comes on the Today programme, as he's just done on the radio, and said he's pet myths here and you have what sounds very much like the big conservative row that we thought would happen after that deal is done just beginning to start now so even though number 10 are pretty uh, relaxed about this even though Chris Grayling appears to have done this within the rules set down by David Cameron I think you're starting to get that debate within the conservative party just about ramping up now the question is whether the great British public will be thoroughly bored of this big euro debate by the time we get to the referendum or whether it can stop feeling like politicians having a row inside the Westminster village uh, and start to really cut through to the people who have to make a huge decision and potentially one within just a few months. Well, for the moment, thank you. The French president, Francois Hollande, has sent his sincere condolences to the families of three people who were killed in an avalanche in the French Alps. Two French schoolchildren and a Ukrainian tourist were killed while skiing near Le Des Alpes report, the resort, which had been closed to the public for a month due to the risk of avalanches. Two other pupils and a teacher were seriously injured. A British aid worker goes on trial in France today for smuggling a child from a refugee camp in Calais to the UK. Rob Laurie, who's from Leeds, is charged with aiding illegal immigration. He hid a four-year-old girl in his vehicle after her family repeatedly begged him to take her to England. Let's talk to our Paris correspondent, Hugh Schofield, who's outside the court in northern France for us. Morning, Hugh. Um, so this case is set to be heard later. Um, an interesting case, a story of compassion, but a man who broke the law, nevertheless. Indeed, and, and Rob Laurie admits quite freely what, what he did. The facts in this case are not in dispute at all. Uh, Rob Laurie is this soldier from Leeds who, if you remember the story, was so moved by the picture of Elan Kurdi, the, the Syrian boy who, who drowned last year, that he began his own aid mission, if you like, to the jungle, the camp in, in Calais, not far from here in Boulogne. Um, he came out there and while uh, working in the camp, befriended a number of people, including, including uh, an Afghan man. Now, this Afghan man tried over and again to persuade um, Rob Laurie to take his four-year-old 
daughter, this young girl called Baha, or Brew, as, as Rob Laurie called her, to uh, family in Leeds, where they were there perfectly legally. Rob Laurie uh, resisted and resisted because he knew it was against the law, but finally he said, cracked one night when the girl was on his knee and said, I, 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 can't, I can't hold that any, no, anymore, and agreed to take her back. He, he smuggled her into his vehicle, but um, unbeknownst to him, two Eritrean men had also got onto his vehicle. They were spotted by detector dogs, and, uh, and she was discovered as well. And after that, of course, he was uh, in custody for five days, charged, and he's back in France today now for this crucial uh, court hearing. OK, Hugh, many thanks for bringing us up today. Hugh Schofield in northern France following that case for us. Thanks. The World Athletics governing body, the IAAF, is braced for further blows to its credibility today. The World Anti-Doping Agency is revealing another report into the doping and corruption scandal. This first report in November led to Russia being suspended from international competition. Britain has a long way to go to ensure equality for transgender people. That's the finding of the first parliamentary committee report on the issue. Yes, the Commons Women and Equality Select Committee found that trans people are discriminated against on a daily basis. It wants the government to draw up a new strategy to tackle the problem within the next six months. What was quite shocking was the level of day-to-day -day discrimination that trans people have to endure, whether that's their inability to be able to access public services or indeed just the way the law doesn't work for them in the way that we would hope it would. Um, that's for me the most shocking thing and that's what our report is focusing in on to make over 30 recommendations to government. Yes, more on that story a little later on after 8.30, you're hearing the personal story of a parent whose six-year-old is transitioning. There are at least three joint winners of the biggest single lottery jackpot in history. A world record jackpot, and it's coming to you right now. Get ready. This is Powerball. So the Powerball game was held in the United States. It had a one and a half billion, yes, billion dollar prize, just over a billion pounds. Lucky tickets were bought in Florida, Tennessee and Los Angeles. Now, the odds of winning were around one in 292 million. If you want that in kind of real terms, you'd have to toss a coin and get heads or tails won 25 times in a row. And it's coming to you right now. It's coming oh, to you right now, Nigel. That's when it's coming to you, right now. <laughs> uh, ten minutes past eight. Uh, one other story for you. It's the TV reunion that fans around the world have been waiting for since New York chums left Central Park for the last time. Of course we're talking about Friends, and the cast is going to come together next month for the first time since the series ended in 2004. No, it's going to be a tribute to no, yeah, comedy we, we director had, James uh, Burroughs. So, we had a really good you'll see Jennifer had, Aniston, Courtney yeah, Cox, Lisa Kudrow, Matt LeBlanc, Matthew Perry and David Schwimmer all featuring in the special programme, which will air next month. A lot of people will be very happy about that. Time now is 11 minutes past eight. Now, we've been hearing that wholesale energy prices have dropped by a fifth in the last year. Predictions are that they're going to stay low for another two years. But as industry prices fall, the amount we pay as customers hasn't. Yesterday, the Energy Secretary warned the big suppliers to look after their customers, with the Prime Minister adding the bills aren't falling fast enough. Lawrence Slade is from Energy UK, represents gas and electricity supplies. Thank you very much for your time this morning, Mr Slade. Uh, first of all, do, do you agree with the Prime Minister that uh, the prices for customers are not falling fast enough? Well, I think it's fair to say that prices are indeed falling, and indeed you've only got to look at the sort of the, the best buy lists that you can get on on some of the switching sites online to see that prices have fallen quite dramatically over the, over the last year and the last few years. So, yeah, it's a case of getting out there and, and going energy shopping. Actually, so you don't agree with the prime minister that prices aren't falling fast enough. Well, look, wholesale price falls is always good news for consumers and the faster prices fall, the better it will be for everyone. Of course, I, I agree that, you know, that price falls are good. I think the point is, though, that we're not getting across to people is there are some dramatically cheaper deals out there. And what we're trying to do is to really encourage people to get out there and make sure they're on the cheapest tariff. If you haven't switched supplier for a couple of years, for instance, you could actually, just by a short phone call, making sure you're on the best tariff of your current supplier, save a couple of hundred quid, or even more if you actually change to a new supplier. So prices are coming down, but there's also this big drive to get people to make sure that they're on the best tariff they can be. So what you're doing is, first of all, you're overcharging people for their energy, and then you're blaming them uh, for them paying too much. 
No, not at all. We're, we're, number one, we're not overcharging. I think there's been a lot of um, sort of talk around the fall in wholesale price. What we really need to remember is that the wholesale price now represents well much lower than 50% of the average electricity or gas bill. There's a number of other costs that may make up your electricity and your gas bills. And some of those background costs, if you will, have actually risen quite dramatically over the last year. One of them, for example, has gone up by around 15% in 2015 alone. So it's not a simple case that a 10% fall in wholesale prices will be re replicated with a 10% fall by your energy bill itself. What, I, what we're also trying to say, though, rather than blaming customers, we're saying, like I did earlier on this year when I got my car insurance renewal, for example, I said, hang on, that's too much. I went into the market. I got a better deal. I changed supplier. So what we're asking people to do is to look at your deal, look at whether you're on the best tariff for your personal circumstances. No one should be worried about how they're going to pay their bill this winter. There are much better deals out there than there were 12 months ago. There are over 50 deals, for example, below a thousand pounds whereas last year that was just a handful so the market is moving and I would really urge people to check that they're with the best tariff with the best company they can because you can save a lot of money as I understand it, the wholesale prices for gas fell 34% uh, in tw 2015 looking at one of the major suppliers in August of last year they cut the prices by 5% so 34% and 5% well look as I say, there are, what, 34 active suppliers in the market at the moment. That essentially means there's 34 different buying policies active in the market at the moment. I think the, the key point here is each company will be looking at the market, each company will be looking at their costs, their overheads, their costs that are outside of their control, the cost for moving energy around the country, the cost for government policies, etc. We've heard, had a lot of debate around that um, since the general election in terms of trying to trim those costs back to reduce bills for customers. When you're looking at making a pricing decision, you're not just looking at wholesale costs, you're looking at all of these other costs that go into every family's bill up and down this country so you know it's not just a simple case of wholesale price has gone down 20 percent therefore bills go down 20 percent each supplier will be looking at this and taking their own risk analysis as to how quickly and how much they can move their prices so what I'm what I'm taking from what you're saying really is if, I, if I'm a customer watching this this morning I, I'm, I'm thinking don't hold your breath if you think the prices are going to come down well, no, I think that's the point, Charlie, that prices have come down. And if you look at, if you go onto a switching site, for example, you will see a tremendous number of different companies who are offering great deals. And that's why I said earlier, if you haven't switched supplier for a year or two years or three years even, or if you've never switched supplier, there are some fantastic deals out there. You know, five years ago, we were only looking at a handful of companies operating in this market. We're now looking at 40, 34 companies operating though, in this the market. The thing is, you keep saying there are fantastic deals out there. Why are there some rubbish deals? Why are there some rubbish deals on offer? Get rid of the rubbish deals. In every market, you will find that there are bad deals, there are good deals. The energy market's no different from that. And I think what we're saying is, you know, look, everybody, some people like fixed deals, some people like variable deals. There's a mix of tariffs available in the market at the moment. And what we're keen to do is to make sure people right, get Mr. on the Sade, right So what you are saying is that a rubbish deal is OK. It's OK for a no. company to put out a rubbish deal. No, of course I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, you know, I get it when I get my electricity bill every month. There's details on there around other tariffs that are available from my supplier. I check that. I see whether I'm on the best deal. If I am, I leave it. If I'm not, then I change the tariff of that supplier. You know, we're trying to get people to engage more in the market. We're trying to get people to, to look at whether they're on the best deal and to make sure they're saving money. You know, these deals are not in secret. These deals are out there. They're very easy to access. If you haven't got access to the Internet, then you can go to someone like Citizens Advice who will help you or a family member. These deals are out there. And you know, really, you, know, you can save an awful lot of money by just making a phone call to your current supplier and making sure you're on the best tariff with them. Uh, Lawrence Slade. Uh, Chief Executive of Energy UK. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Time to talk to Matt for a look at the morning's weather. Matt, there's been a lot of snow around, hasn't there?